Okay, so now we're going to start our second module, and the goal is really to focus on different examples that will go more in depth of all this role of social and environmental and economic determinants, particularly related to health. Um, the very first one I want to talk about is geocoding. So what is this? Let's say that the data that you have, and ideally would like to do some spatial analysis with that, has no maps, has nothing, but it has addresses of people. So geocoding is a routine that now is all automated, that is able to link addresses that you might have in your file with a reference file that has all the streets in a particular area. So the, the quality of the geocoding is going to be as good as the quality of the data that you have. If you have addresses that are incomplete, ambiguous, they don't have the right name of the street, they don't have the number of the house, then probably you're not going to be able to geocode a huge percentage of your data, which is going to make the data not useful for the work you want to do. Another issue is maybe you have some hospital records for a particular disease that do not allow you to use the addresses because of confidentiality issues. And we're going to go back to the issue of confidentiality in the third module. So it can be that you do have the ideal data, but you're not allowed to use the data to geocode the data because you don't have permission for that. Now, the, the key thing in here that I want to catch your attention to is the fact that this is really nothing new. And this is the famous map of Jon Snow that took all the cholera cases in London, took a map that had all the street addresses, and basically plotted them in there and was able to see that one of the high risk areas was near the Broad Street pump. And although at that time nobody knew that cholera was transmitted via the water, they, were, they shut down the pump and they reduced the cases. So this was an example of geocoding, not automated, he did this by hand, um, but basically using the same idea. It's plotting cases to which you have addresses in a map and then being able to do any kind of analysis you want. The second thing that is really powerful, although it's still exploratory, but it's the first sort of the first natural step that you should have is to visualize the data. So just like when you're working with data, you make tables, you try to get averages, you build confidence intervals, you test uh, some hypothesis. With spatial data, you want to visualize the data and then try to see if you can find particular aspects in the distribution of variables across space. If maybe you can see some patterns that are, could be interesting to study further, but you need to be careful when you look for patterns because patterns can be just a trick of your brain when you look at something. I can look at a map and see no patterns. You can look at a map and see a fantastic pattern. What we need to do is to then run a test to see if that pattern is really significant. And we're going to go into that in a minute. Um, we can also make a map, so visualize the data and find a problem in the data. And here's an example fresh from the press. This has just been recently published. And what you're looking in here is a map of Africa that has the locations of the different species of schistosoma. So we're looking at schistosomiasis here. Now, if you know anything about schistosomiasis in Africa, and if you know anything about the landscape in Africa, you would say there is a hole in the middle of the map. What is happening with the GRC? And basically, we have no data for the GRC. Looking at this map, it doesn't mean there is no schistosoma in the GRC. It is in there, and schistosomiasis is there, but we have no data, which is a problem because then if we don't have the data, we cannot measure the burden, we cannot understand how the transmission happens, and we cannot address this issue with policies that can be effective. The other thing we can do with visualization is to see trends over time. And to me, one of the best examples of that is to look at obesity in the US. So those maps were produced by the CDC, and it's a long time series showing how obesity changed in the US over time by states. So this is state level. And we start with a map in 1990. And that time, we needed only four colors in the map to describe obesity. 
And over time, more colors had to be added because obesity became such a huge problem. And if you compare the first map, 1990, with the last map, 2010, you can see how those things changed in such a short period of time. So again, um, you're not making any particular sophisticated conclusions about this, but you are showing a very clear trend over time in this one indicator. There's the saying that a map is worth a thousand words, so you have 4,000 words here just in one slide. Another way of visualizing data, um, which is quite interesting actually, it's called cartogram. And the whole idea here is to map variables considering the density of the variable across space. So what you're looking at uh, are cases and deaths of malaria in the world. And in this particular map, what you can see is the Americas become almost like this stripe of land that you can barely recognize. And then the huge burden is really in Africa. And that's the goal of those maps. You can't really recognize the boundaries of countries. That's not the goal of the map. The goal of the map is to shock you by representing the variable that you want uh, proportionally to the importance of the variable in each area. And, and there is a link in the bottom of the slide that allows you to make your own maps, but also has a huge library of maps available that anybody can download and, and use. Now, this is a very useful and extremely important geospatial technique. It's what we call point pattern analysis. So the goal in here is to try to identify patterns in the data that you have, but identify those patterns and check the significance of them. So there is no issue about I see one thing and you see another thing. You run a test and the test will tell you if that particular pattern is statistically significant or not. Um, this is quite useful for, for finding clusters, for example. And clusters, it can be something extremely useful if you're doing health-related studies. And there are some clustering techniques that you can run controlling for other variables. So you can bring, again, the social and the environment um, into the picture when you are trying to find those clusters. As I mentioned before, looking for those patterns can be done in a global way, and you're basically answering yes or no question. Do I have a pattern? Yes or no. But you can also look for those patterns locally. And now, not only you are finding if you do have a pattern, but you are locating in your study area where this pattern is. Now, that's extremely helpful because you can start assessing to what extent the social, economic, and environmental conditions in the area that has a cluster are different than areas that do not have a cluster. And this is extremely useful information. Now, there is a huge list of different indicators that can be used in trying to find patterns. The list is huge. I only listed two, three of them in here, Moran's Eye, GI, and Scan Statistics. But we could spend one hour just going over the many different tests that we have. What is important to keep in mind, and I really want to stress this out, are three things. The first one is what point pattern analysis is not going to tell you anything about is causality. So just because you find a pattern in one area and you compare the characteristics of people in this area with the characteristics of people in another area, that says nothing about causality, either geographically or social. Okay. The second thing is Whatever patterns you find depend on the way you define the space that we discussed in the first module. So the way you define the neighborhood, the way you define how you expect things to be related in the space determines the results that you get. So if we have the same data set and I run a clustering test using a neighborhood definition and you run another, the same test using a different neighborhood definition, we're going to reach different results. Neither of us is wrong. But then the question is, which neighborhood definition makes sense for the particular phenomena you're trying to look at and for the particular research question you have? And the third thing is, whatever results you have depend on the scale you used, depend on the quality of the data, on the sample size that you have, and depend on how the boundary definitions 
were made. So I'm going to show you a few examples. Again, this one comes from my own work. So what was the idea here? The idea here is I showed you the framework before, and I mentioned how uh, complex studying frontier malaria can be. So the very first step was to see if space matters in this particular context. I'm assuming it does. I put it in the framework, but I need to test if it really does before I can jump into all the analysis, bringing together the different components. And what you see in here are the results using one of those tests, the many tests we have. And this particular test showed where we had clusters of high transmission of low transmission and areas where no significant clustering pattern was observed. And then this was sort of the first step in a much more elaborated analysis that brought together different scales and different factors in trying to explain the social, economic, and environmental drivers of transmission in this particular setting. That's another very interesting example because this one is looking at cases of dengue fever in Vietnam. But the whole issue here is to try to use one particular clustering test that allows to account for the temporal effect as well. So in this case, a test called scan statistic was used and it was able to find clusters of dengue cases, but divided by the phase of the transmission. So the circles that you see on the map, they are colored according if they are in the early stages of the epidemic, the middle or the late. And again, if you think that all this work is not just to produce beautiful maps, but to be able to translate those results into polis, and you know where the clusters in the early phases are happening, you can intensify your vector control measures, your educational campaigns in trying to stop the transmission to spread at that stage and not wait until the later stages when most likely the transmission is going to phase down and move somewhere else to be able to act. Another technique is spatial interpolation. This can be really handy when what you have are basically sample points from your location and you just want to have a sort of global overview of the phenomena you're looking at. The example I give here is not health related. It's quite simple actually. What you have are samples of elevation in a particular area and then you interpolate this data to come up with a surface of elevation for that area. Now the reason I'm not giving you a more sophisticated example here is because we can do a much better job than interpolation. Despite the fact that if you use some of the most um, common softwares to do this kind of work. Um, interpolation is right there and you're going to be tempted to do an interpolation to be able to get a surface uh, of your variable. Um, we can actually produce something that is the best linear unbiased spatial predictor. So we can do what we call a spatial estimation of your variable. What you're going to do is you're going to move from sample points, as you can see on the left side of the slide, to a surface of estimated points. And what's going to allow you to do this transition from sample points to a surface is by characterizing the spatial structure in the data based on the distance. What that means is we're going to draw a function like you see in the middle of the slide, and this function describes how are two points related to each other if they are x meters apart. Now, the beauty of this is you can get any two points. So you can get a point that you have to a point that you want to estimate. If you know the distance between them, you know exactly how they should be spatially related. And then you can replicate this spatial structure and generate your surface. So, if you really need to get a surface, you can do a much better job with this technique that is called Krieging than with interpolation. And here's an example that actually uses MATLAB data. Um, and the goal here was to look at cholera incidence. And this is actually a model that has covariates, 
Uh, it has social, economic, environmental variables behind this model. And what you do is you can get a surface of color incidence, but because this model is probabilistic, you can also get a surface of the variance in the estimates. So not only you have estimated values, but you know how good of a job you did in estimating those numbers for each one of the locations, which gives you much more confidence to then go ahead and use those results. Then we really go into the core. Um, it's what we all are used to do is to run regressions and bring all the social economic, so to, to see the role of social, environmental, and economic factors in the particular health outcome we're looking at. So the rationale is usually you're going to run a linear model. You start simple, and then you look at the residuals. Well, what you expect is that your residuals are going to be independent and normally distributed. What that means is if they're independent, there's absolutely no structure left in the residuals to be modeled. Well, if that's the case, you have the right model, you're good to go, you don't have to do anything else. Now, imagine a scenario where you run your model, you have your residuals, and now, just for fun, you get one of those tests of spatial autocorrelation, you apply in your residuals, and it's significant. So that basically tells you that you have autocorrelation in your residuals. If that happens, your residuals now are not independent anymore. So you basically violated the assumption of independence in the residuals. When that happens, all your coefficients, your t-tests, your confidence intervals, your standard deviations are biased. And what you have to do is to account for the spatial effects in your model. Great. Then the question is how you do that. Well, there are many different ways you can incorporate space into your model. The best one depends on the data that you have. It depends on what is the research question that you're asking. And it depends on the conceptual framework that you have for your model. So we saw some conceptual frameworks in module one, and that should guide you on defining the model, on defining the question, and then defining how we're gonna handle space um, in your model. Now, there are many different types of spatial regression. I only listed some in here. I give you a link in the bottom that it's, a, it's an online book that has a very nice description of the different types of spatial regression. But the key issue here is you can go very simple, for example, by just using lag terms. So use autoregressive spatial models. And you can go very sophisticated by running spatial Bayesian models, spatial multi-level models, and again, if you need to do the more complicated, it depends on the data and the question that you have. I want to show you one example that uses data from the demographic and health survey. And the goal in here was to combine area level, socioeconomic data, access data, environmental data with individual level data. So you have the different scales and you have the different dimensions. You have the social, the economic, and the environment. You want to combine all of this in one model to be able to see variations in individual HIV status. And the way they handle the space in this particular model was to allow the coefficients that you're estimating for each one of the covariates to vary in a space. In other words, when you run a regression model, you get one coefficient, let's say you have income in your model. You're modeling infant mortality and you have income is one of the covariates. You get one coefficient for income and the assumption is that effect of income applies to your entire study area. What they decided to do was to relax this assumption and allow this coefficient to vary spatially. And here is just one of the results. What we see is on the left side, we see the map of T values, basically the map that shows the significance of the coefficient, in this case, distance to a major role um, and the impact of that in the status, HIV status of women. So what we're looking at is the areas where the coefficient is indeed significant. And you can see it's not in the entire area. It's basically in that center area of Malawi where the coefficients that you got 
for this variable are significant. Now you can take another covariate and the significance is gonna be in a different area. So the message here is that if you look at one particular variable, the effect of this variable is not the same across the entire area. And if you look at different covariates, not all of them impact in the same area. So you can have one particular location where one covariate stands out as the main driver of the phenomenon you're looking at. And you can look at a different area and the main driver is another one. And that's an important result. Why? Again, you want to be able to use this knowledge that you're producing to translate into policies. And your policies can be informed by this knowledge detailed by the space. <clears throat> on the right side, what you see is a map with the clusters from the DHS. And again, this is using DHS data. You can have all this data in the in-depth network that also has the locations, some are clusters of villages, for example, and do exactly the same kind of work. It's the same analogy. And we're going to see in a minute that actually this has been done for some of the in-depth data as well. Now, the last sort of geospatial technology I wanted to talk about is remote sensing. And the reason is because this is really important. Remote sensing, which basically means using satellite images, radar images, or aerial photographs, are one of the main sources of environmental variables that we use in all of those frameworks that I showed you before. So really the goal of using the imagery is to be able to produce variables that usually you don't collect in your survey for different reasons. One, it's hard to cover the entire study area to be able to measure those variables. You probably don't have enough resources to be able to do it. You don't have enough personnel to cover the entire area to be able to measure this. And the idea is you can get an imagery and acquire variables related to land cover, land use, how the land changed over time, elevation, vegetation, uh, the climate. You have sensors that are designed to measure precipitation, temperature, cloudness, all of those variables. Um, but you can go beyond producing variables that are sort of the standard natural environment and human-made environment. You can actually capture risk factors depending on the disease you're looking at. So, for example, you can measure deforestation and to what extent those patterns of deforestation can impact the transmission of vector-borne diseases. You can look at pollution. We have sensors designed just to be able to measure uh, different components um, of air pollution. So you can use those variables in your model as well. And another use that it's not widespread is to get the nominators. For example, you can use, uh, there is an imagery that looks at lights, at night, and you can use this information to be able to come up with the estimates of population in a particular area. Or you can get an imagery of a village and be able to identify the locations of houses and again, try to come up with an estimation of the population in the area. The other use is when you're working, for example, in a village that there is absolutely no map available for that village. And you wanted to do some spatial analysis. What do you do? You can use an imagery to produce maps, to capture roads, uh, to design where the hospitals are, the compounds are. So you can also use the imagery or aerial photographs to be able to produce the standard maps that you're going to use to link with your data, with your survey data, census data, whatever you have. Um, what is important to keep in mind is that you can have satellite images that have a resolution of 61 centimeters, for example. So anything on the ground that is 61 centimeters or larger, you can identify. You can identify a person, you can identify a car and so on. But no matter how detailed the imagery is, the scale that you're gonna work with depends on the scale of the health-related data that you have. So if you have your in-depth data that is at a village level, and you get a satellite image that is quite detailed. So you have several pixels inside one village. You are still gonna have to aggregate that at a village level and then bring this variable from the imagery at a village level into your analysis. So again, doesn't matter how detailed 
is the imagery that you acquire. The final resolution you're going to use depends on the resolution of the data, the health data that you have. Now, I try to give you just, just a small flavor of the different applications that we have on health using remote sensing. And you can see here you have dengue, malaria, leish, schisto, cholera. The applications are many. Um, there are several applications on air pollution and respiratory diseases. So it's quite wide, quite widespread, and it's becoming even more because the price to acquire those images is really going down. Now, the questions that are still here is, okay, we can do all those beautiful things. We can use those geospatial techniques, generate some evidence, improve policy making, but what are the challenges? Uh, what are the problems that we have to address when doing any kind of spatial analysis? And above all, how do I do that? What kind of tools are available for anybody to be able to take their own data merge with something else, and then do spatial analysis. That's going to be the topic of the third and last module.